Jamie, thanks for coming on the Friday Club with myself and Dr. Fran Berry. Uh, we're going to talk about your career and, and life so far. Um, you are a bit of an enigma to most uh, people in racing, so hopefully we can enlighten them. Um, a charismatic enigma, I might say. But uh, Jamie, let's start at the beginning. How did you first develop the love for horses and racing? <clears throat> um, we always had ponies around the home we were growing up and lived in a farm, so you know, kind of a second nature to kind of get, get into my sister ponies before I had them and um, just start riding them and obviously like them more and more after a while. Your father trained a, a few national unholes, didn't you? <clears throat> yeah, father was jumps trainer. Um, never had a big string. Um, and it was, it was all basically before, before my sister and I were born. Um, but yeah, he trained to a reasonable level. He shot the winner. And so he did all right. Outside, this is the final hurdle. Winning pair and Alan Lilly's still the leader. From Omal jumped in second. Born broke a third. Naredis on the stand side and it's winning fair from Omal. Born broker and Farney Fox finishing very fast. Coming up to the line now, it's winning fair from Old Mull and Farney Fox and Kill Charles finishing fast for the Naratus. It's winning fair, he's going to win it. 20 yards to run. And winning fair is just going to hold Farney Fox and Kill Charles at the line. Winning fair is the winner. And Fran, obviously, Jamie burst onto the scene as a young riding teenage sensation. You you must have known him back then. What was he like as a, as a kid? Did you always know he was going to be the talent he is now? Oh, yeah, he was very, Jamie was very forward, Martin. Um, actually, one of his early rides, he rode with my dad. I think I led him up in the Curra um, and uh, on Ballyhook, maybe, was it, Jamie? But uh, uh, Jamie started in the autumn before I did, uh, to 1995, Jamie, I'd say, and I started in 1996. And uh, there was a generation of us there, Jamie, Shane, Kelly, uh, Deccan McDonough all kind of came through to one time, a good good bunch of lads, Gordon Power, and... Uh, you know, obviously, Jamie had a great time starting off, but uh, the Harris Con winning the Guineas at, what, 17 years old, that was a massive, massive day for him. Racing now towards the final furlong, and as they do so, Crazy Mentel and Kitsa fight it out from Harris Con. Lawina Rose right over on the stand rail, then Chatouche Mempari, heed my warning from far back. Inside the final furlong, Harris Con and Kitsa fight it out as they race up towards the line. Kitsa and Harris Con, and Harris Con is up. Harris Con's won it for Jamie Spencer. I think, I think that was the record for the youngest rider to win a classic does that still stand jamie <clears throat> um i don't know <laughs> yeah it's a long time ago but um yeah no it's, i was obviously very fortunate to get on her at the time um as Fran said we it's a good few of us started together and plenty still still going now um so yes yeah, i was lucky to get on her at a young age and obviously it worked out and um yeah i have to be thankful to the stacks what do you remember of that day um, I forgot my helmet, so I had to get a lend of Shane Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> Did it fit you? Yeah. It, yeah, it was over my eyes most of the race. <laughs> no, um, uh, what do you remember? Yeah, obviously, it's <clears throat> you, you remember <clears throat> lots of things of you know, the good days, um, how the race went. She was tricky at the stalls, and um, it all worked out well, and had a pretty much a clear run, and she got up in the last half of Furlong. Um, Beat Jamie Heffernan actually. He was riding one of Mrs. Stockwell's horses for Aiden. Um, so, you know, we're still all kind of friendly. And he's, I didn't actually miss call from Jamie last night. So, probably still moaning about it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Jamie, uh, prior to Taras coming to Guineas, her last bit of work went great, didn't it? Um, everything went to plan. She worked super. <laughs> I don't know. Was it you that messed up the work? Or was it <laughs> Magoo? Well, somebody messed up the work. I think it could have been you. It Tommy was me, yeah. It was Tommy me, was yeah. Happy. You, you always knew when Tommy was in, uh, the work hadn't gone well when you went back to the barn and that happened. You made yourself pretty scarce for, for <clears throat> half an hour. Could be near yeah. the roster. It wasn't me, anyway. Uh, yeah, for, for people watching at home, I suppose, uh, to go back to what happened, uh, I, I was brought in to ride, ride work with uh, Taris. <coughs> I think it, was, think it might have been Time Limit was running the guineas as well and Vincent Roster, the work rider, was leading the work. But, of course, we missed a beat at the start and we ended up about 20 lengths behind him and the work ended up being a disaster, didn't it? Yeah, yeah. Tommy wasn't happy anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. <laughs> well, lucky it all worked out well in the end. How many winners did you had up to that point? 
Um, geez, I don't know. I think I was claiming five or three. I, can, I think I was claiming five. But yeah, so no, I don't, I don't know, 30 or 40, I'm guessing. Not, not a lot. I hadn't, I'd actually had a bad start to that season. It was only my second winner. Um, I literally had my first winner a couple of days before. We're talking the end of May, so I'd had two months of not doing a whole pile. So <clears throat> it just shows you just getting a lucky position and you know, get an opportunity and then things work out from there. And then the following year, I think you were champion apprentice. Who, who were your apprentice to at that time? I was the apprentice to Liam Brown. Um, I was, I was probably one of the last. Timmy Houlihan came after me. Um, Lord rest his soul. He came after me, but after, I think it was one of the last apprentices he had. Obviously, he had Tommy Carmody, Stephen Crane, Canaan. Um, he had a dynasty of apprentices over like a thirty-year period. Um, but he was he was a hard taskmaster. But um, <clears throat> when I look back now, you know, you appreciate having worked for him because he, you know, basically kept you on the straight and narrow and generally got a boot up the arse rather than a, a talking to. Um, so that was, that, was his kind of, that was his kind of the way he, the way he worked. But, you know, it, it was good times and, you know, I look back on it fondly now. Well, do you know what? I've got, um, I'm jumping forward by about 10 years now, but do you remember that time in a new market when, when he stayed in your house and me and Hughesy <laughs> stayed there? <laughs> Uh, it was in a lifetime ago when Husey was um, a bit of a wild boy. He came to stay, Martin and Husey came to stay with me. And Liam Brown was staying with me for the sales. So basically, I was like the same to bed at half eight every night, up to make him a cup of tea at six, everything. So I got up the next morning. And uh, so I go, oh, good morning, Mr. Brown. He goes, that Richard Hughes tried to get into bed with me last night. <laughs> I mean, think back now, it's hilarious. Because me and Husey shared the bed and we sneaked in come back from dinner, we'd be in the pub and we sneaked in and, and uh, we're sharing a bed. The middle of the night, Hughesy got up to go to the bathroom and woke me up and, and I heard the, the chain flush and a door close. He didn't come back. I was like, well, he's either got in bed with Jamie and Emma or Liam Brown. Either way, there's going to be fireworks. So I led me up about two minutes to Liam Brown. Um, he roared like a lion and then Hughesy screamed and ran out. <laughs> yeah. They were, they, were, they were good days. So oh, anyway, I must recount when Chips Day. Yeah, they were good days in, uh, <laughs> in that house in Newmarket. Moving strictly on. So look, you've, you've, you've won the Guineas, you're champion apprentice, and then you decide to make the move to England uh, when you were about 19? Yeah, I came um, in the millennium. Um, yeah, Ireland obviously is <clears throat> it's a, tight, it's a tight shop and I could see that... You know, it's going to be a freelance, and it was there wasn't going to be a lot of opportunities. So, I sort of gave myself the chance of moving to England. I thought I'd give it a year or two, and then if it didn't work out, I could always go home or whatever. Um, so, I came in the millennium, and same like everything in racing, it's all about luck and opportunities. I was riding second stroke, third string to Luca Kamani. Um, always like. I'd have been going to the second, as I say, third meetings. And then Frankie had his plane crash in June, and he was generally getting the pick of the rides when he could ride them. Um, and obviously, he had his plane crash, so he was off. And then at Ascot, Kieran had his fall and he hurt his shoulder. And basically, I went from riding the ones at Thursk and Ripon and you know, the evening meetings that Frankie couldn't go to and Kieran was otherwise engaged for Luca, I ended up riding all the horses. So, you know, you get a lucky opportunity and obviously it worked out well and we had some decent horses at the time and, you know, it's, it's just fortunate. Just got lucky, you know. Here's the race towards the final furlong. Gossamer sweeps to the front from Starborn and then comes Alster Miria, Ron Key and Kurnikova. Quarter Moon's running on on the far side, but it's Gossamer and Jamie Spencer out in front, three, four lengths clear from Starborn. Quarter Moon running on well on the outside, but Gossamer wins it in style. Gossamer and Jamie Spencer win it. In that first association with Luca, uh, <coughs> Gossamer was another one that won a guineas for you. She loved soft ground. I remember coming back, she absolutely bolted up it on a heavy track in the car, Jamie. Yeah, she was owned by a lovely man called Gerald Lee. Um, and uh, yeah, she won the Phillies Mile as a two-year-old, and then she won the Guineas, uh, Irish Guineas. 
on soft ground. She, she was very ground dependent. Um, she was, um, yeah, she, they were good times. Um, obviously, Luca had a big, big string then, probably had 100 horses. So we yeah, had a few, few good horses at the time. Um, and yeah, I was just very fortunate to get the opportunities that I had there. Um, but he was, he was quite a good man to work for. Um, very strict and you know, regimental. Um, I remember once forgetting my whip to ride out and he said, he said you're like a tennis player without a racket. No good to me, send me home. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of what Luca was like. Um, yeah, you know, good times, good times. I had a lot of winners for Luca. I was just, I was just watching Luca on, on Look on Sunday and um, he must have been doing it from his office and there was all the pictures behind him, were pictures of you riding winners for him you obviously had a good association when I look back now it's you know the opportunity you gave me when I was only maybe 20 or 21 it's, it's huge it all came from somebody else's misfortune you know Frank and Kieran would have ridden the horses if they hadn't been out and I just got lucky and I won a few races on them and kept the rides on them it was just one of those things so um but you know there was plenty of other jockeys I suppose you could have put on at the time but he, he trusted me to ride the horses and had um three really good seasons with him um he was yeah good good man to work for his and his international record was second to none yeah, i think he enjoyed that as much as anything um, obviously he won derbies and many other classics but around the world he won all the big races um <clears throat> breeders cup probably the only thing that eluded him and um well, actually yeah, he had a uh, he had um barathea he had one of the models barathea. Yeah, who was, rolled barathea frankie that was oh, his first uh, flying dismount. Right. Of course he did. Well, you say um, you say you had a lot of luck, but obviously you were, you were, you were getting the job done. You were winning massive races at such an early age. After Lucas, you went. I think you were second jockey for Godolphin for for a spell, weren't you? Was that just after them? Yeah, that was kind of that was basically like uh, very little work and getting paid to do nothing really. Because at the time, Godolphin only had um, it was like a very elite string of horses that I think it might have been 40 or 50 horses so you were just there in case something happened Frank you <clears throat> he couldn't ride or he was suspended or whatnot um so yeah I think I had two years maybe two years something like that we could often but that was nice good day I was mainly working with David Loader because <clears throat> obviously Saeed only had a, a, a smallish string and Frankie wrote all those um, with a lot of two-year-olds at David Loader's and yeah, that was, it was a busy time. Um, I think we had 14, 14 two-year-old winners in a row one year. Um, first 14 won or something like that. He, he was, he was, got after his horses, he, he made them tough and he was good to watch with Byron strokes to the front, running into the dip from Tari Blue Tomato. Graham Reward is really struggling to pick up here and it's Byron that skips away from Tari. Graham Reward, heavy weather and Byron from Tari and Graham Reward Wins the Mill Reef. Probably just second. Just around that time, Jamie, obviously you're riding for uh, Godolphin, you're in demand. Uh, you picked up the ride on Brian Baru in the ledger in 2003 for Aiden. Uh, of course, he duly won, and um, that le led to you moving, getting a job, I suppose, in Valley Oil. But that, that win in the ledger in its own right, though, that was a huge thing for you. I remember we unfortunately lost Kieran Kelly that year. It wasn't too long after that happened. Good friend of yours. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I was riding a group of on and off for Aiden <clears throat> at that time. Um, um, obviously, I'd ridden Hawkwing in the Guineas the year before. That he didn't win, obviously. Um, and Brian Brew, yeah, it was good to, good to get a good to get a classic winner. He was he was a good, tough, honest horse. And as you alluded to there, um, Kieran Kelly had only just died the previous month, so you know we myself him. Uh, Paul Maloney and Paul Wade had shared a house together in, in when I was living in Ireland. So we'd always remain friends and he, <clears throat> he'd only just ridden his first Cheltenham winner. So yeah, it's, um, when, I always, when I look back on any time I look at the picture of Brian Murray, I always, I always think of Kieran Kelly. I think of most, of, most, most days and most weeks anyway, but um, you only have to look at the picture. So yeah, it's bittersweet memories. Indeed, and uh, there was a rider in second in that uh, ledger it wasn't too hard to get by I don't think was it? <laughs> Marty was second yeah I think um, for Marcus Stragani. Um 
yeah, it's a, I'm not can't remember. I, I think he won the Oaks that year, so I wouldn't feel too sorry. <laughs> yeah, you, you ruined the party for me. I thought I was going to ride two classic winners in one year, but we'll move on to uh, another classic winner later was, on. Was that, when you beat was, that, was that before or after Martin Road and Longchamp then? Made a run? Uh, that was the next day. <laughs> 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 uh, why is he not being nice to you, Martin? Uh, well, I was hoping that that, that would be the case, but um, so it, so then, yeah, two thousand three, you moved back to Ireland, didn't you? Yeah, I went back to Ireland um, two thousand three. I had a year at Aidens, one not very successfully. <clears throat> um, oh yeah, two thousand four was riding in Ireland, so I was champion jockey, but that's kind of where it sort of began and ended. Um, yeah, not not much really. Went great. Um, didn't have that many good horses, and um, yeah, it's just one of the, one of those years. Um, it's, you know, it's like everything in life. You get it's like experience. You know, when I first went to work for Liam Brown, you look at it and think, "Oh, that, that was disappointing." But when you look back now, it's all part of growing up, isn't it? Um, still quite young then, and yeah, look back and you you gain experience for further further down the line. You've you've touched on that. You've obviously got the Bally Doyle job. Do you think um, some people did say? Do you think it came a little bit early in your career, or as you've said, do you think it was just a little bit of a case of unlucky because um, they didn't quite have the the power of horses that they normally have that year? <coughs> um, I suppose you'd have to say, in hindsight, it probably came earlier than ideal. But I look back on a lot of things that happened. You know, like even. For example, going to Hong Kong, I probably went younger than I should have done. You know, you look at the t- you think at the time you're ready for all these, you know, situations. But in reality, you're not. You know, norm- normal normal people are still in co- college at you know 23 years of age, uh, not with you know in a you know multi million pound job with you know where stallions matter. Um, so you know a lot of it. You know, sometimes you can be wasted on the young, but as time goes on, you see, you know, when you get the experience, you say, oh, if I knew then what I know now, things would be a bit different, but you can't change what's happened and, you know, look forward, not back. And would you have done anything different, knowing what you know now? Well, when you're more experienced for the, the, the tougher days, you know, <clears throat> when everything is go, go smoothly and... You don't hit any speed ramps. Obviously, life is easy. But when you know when when, when things get tough, um, very very few sports people go through their whole careers without you know hitting a speed ramp. Um, but you know it's how you handle it afterwards. Um, I suppose it's how you d- define yourself as a person. You can you look at Frankie, he's in you know whatever seven or eight years ago he he had a bit of a bump in the road, but he's come back bigger and stronger. And I suppose he's the best example of of um, someone getting stuck in. Well, that's a philosophical way of looking at it, like you always do. But So you came back to England 2005 with a bang, really, didn't you? Because you were champion jockey that year when you came back. Yeah, I suppose I got lucky. Kieran wasn't here and Frankie had a fall and got injured. So I suppose I got lucky. Um, and <clears throat> it was just, you know, it was good to do. I wrote a lot of winners. Um, um, yeah, I wrote a lot, of, a lot of winners that year for a lot of different trainers. I was I was basically freelance. Um, I don't think I wrote more than ten winners for any one trainer. So um, <laughs> I didn't have much choice. It was sink or swim time because I had no no job and uh, had to kick on and do something. Um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's, you know, being champion jockey isn't easy, um, and it's it's quite a demanding thing. Uh, but so yeah. It's, Glad to get it done. Chris McGraw was your agent that time, was he? Yeah, Chris McGraw was my agent. Uh, he's an extremely nice man. Um, too bright for me. Um, yeah, he's, he's, very, he's very smart. and um, I enjoyed actually working with Chris. Um, he's easygoing. <clears throat> um, I think he said at the time, I was quite, quite aloof to everything. I didn't, I didn't know how many kids he had or I just kind of was tunnel vision to try and be champion jockey um, but it, it worked out well um, but he sacked me after one year <laughs> 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 too much too much work and not enough pay 
<laughs> and uh, Jamie went on to be joint champion jockey with Seb Sanders, of course. That was an epic battle for a whole season. I remember you were riding Muslimer in the day, flying down to Wolverhampton in the evening. It was uh, pretty intense stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. That was 2007 or eight, I think. Um, yeah, so yeah, that was kind of a lot of winners that year, I think. I think over 200 winners. Inside the final furlong, Herbal Moon, Honolulu, the stands rail, then script rider, 100 yards left to go. Herbal Moon by a couple of lengths to Honolulu. The favourite wins, Herbal Moon lifts the e in second, Honolulu. You're a champion that year, but you, you really made a name for yourself. I mean, you got the nickname the Babyface Assassin for your hold up tactics and coming late and. Um, and you won a lot of big races in, in that way. Is that, did you make a decision to ride in that way or was just how you enjoyed riding? Um, Fran will probably tell you that when you start riding in Ireland, the one thing trainers hate the most is, get, is going too soon and, and getting beaten. It's kind of, it's always, I suppose, been instilled in me a little bit that way. Um, you see, especially jumps racing is, as much as anything. Um, but yeah, it's, I've probably made the running on a lot of winners is over, throughout my career um, as much as anything else. But I suppose, you know, people uh, pigeonhole you for holding horses up. It's, um, it is what it is. Um, <clears throat> I suppose there is, there, there is a good, um, good feeling to when you maybe come through the pack and win a race. Well, let's look at some of the good horses rode. We've got, we've got to look at Sariska. You made a good link up with Michael Bell and I mean, she was good for you this May, wasn't she? If we look at the um, the Epsom <coughs> that year you won, I think 2009. Um, I mean, she was pretty good that that day, wasn't she? She liked soft ground, and it was only it was good ground on the day. Um, um, the race went smooth enough. I, I booted her on at the top of the straight because it felt her um, her forte was her stamina, and probably in hindsight, I almost got myself beat because she got there and idled, and, and she only just held on from midday. Midday on the inside, trying to draw level now with Sariska. They come up with a furlong to go. It's Sariska on the near side, and they're up. Fighting back is Midday. They're clear of high yield. They reach the water line now. Sariska on the near side. Midday fighting back. Sariska and Midday in a furlong. We learned from that, and she went to Ireland, and after that, and won, um, I think, I can remember doing a piece of work on her between Epsom and Ireland. It's just small things you remember in your life. Um, she did like one proper gallop uh, with a good lead horse. And he, I remember Michael Bell saying, oh, just join up with the two pole and let her enjoy herself to the winning post. And I looked around and the horse that I must have beaten about 20 lengths without even asking. So we knew, we knew she'd improved a good bit from, from Epsom. And um, you know, obviously she won very easily in Ireland before she learned her tricks and not jumping out of the stalls. If we go back to Epsom, I have to say, I watched it this morning. Um, you, you seemed, you challenged on the outside and it looked like a little bit of a professional foul when you, you came in and kind of closed the door a little bit on midday. Would that be fair to say? Yeah, probably. Probably. I got a few days for it. So, you know, um, I wanted to get, I wanted to commit her early because I won, when I won the Musador and I, I did that. Um, but, you know, it's like every, every day you ride a horse, you learn a bit more. And... Yes, uh, after that race worked out that she didn't want to be there too soon. If, uh, if I'd probably ridden her more reservedly, she, she probably would have won without a smack. So um, she got me out of the out of trouble that day. And um, yeah, it's a good result. Um, it, was, it was a typical Spencer, close the door on your way past. You did it to me at Kempton last week. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, moving on. <laughs> so, so then she won the Irish Oaks. I have to. I watched that as well. What did you say to the jockey in second when he went past? Um, I can't remember. So I waved at him anyway. It was, it was Fran in second. So, um, yeah, and that's. I think it was an unfair match at that stage. Um, ref should have rang the bell. What did he say to you, Fran? Can you remember? Do you know? Do you know what the funny thing is, Martin? I, I was going that hard to, to try and be second or win the race. That I came in and everybody said, "What? What's that Spencer at doing that to you?" I said, 
what, what do you mean? <laughs> then I seen the video sure he's, he, he waved goodbye to me and that was it. But uh, it's one of the iconic moments <coughs> isn't it, that you've seen in a race. You have Paul Carberry uh, recently he was played uh, on B, B for Sam waving back at best mate uh, in Leopardstown and of course, you Jamie and the Irish Open. Sir Riska doing the same. It was just one of them moments that keeps getting played out. Sir Riska is coming there, tanking for Jamie Spencer. Grace O'Malley is fourth. They're heading for the final furlong. Roses for the Lady Midday. And Sir Riska coming there effortless now to complete an Oaks double. Jamie Spencer looks around and toys with the opposition as Sir Riska bolts in to win a second Oaks for Jamie Spencer and Michael Bell. I don't know, I don't know why I did it. Why I did it. But, um, I, I just enjoy it. I'm a decent horse or you know it's, it's it's hard to describe what it's like you know it's like when you get on a good horse you know we ride so many bad ones that when you get on a good one it's you know, it's just a different feeling um <clears throat> and if you can make the horse do it as easy as possible well, why not actually you we go on about holding horses up but you you gave phoenix of spain a great ride to win the guineas for charlie hills he was a good honest tough horse um I had no instructions. Um, he was a bit keen going to post. I was drawn one, and I thought the car um, with a big field there can be quite congested at the at the five pole. So I thought, well, I'll go forward, and then maybe let one or two slot across me. But after going for long and a half, Andrea came, and he was sat in my quarters, and it became very apparent that I was going to get, <coughs> going to get an easy lead. So I dropped the hammer, and I was able to get a couple of couple of lengths on them and on the day he was very dominant and yeah, it's good horse to have. They're racing inside the two and it's Phoenix of Spain and Jamie Spencer from two Dan Hot and Frankie Dettori. Scardu is next on the far side for James Doyle but it's Phoenix of Spain quickening on three lengths clear from two Dan Hot and then Scardu and Decrypt but Phoenix of Spain has made just about all the win the Tannis of Irish 2000 guineas. Second is two Dan Hot. He beat two Dan Hot <coughs> everybody thought he wouldn't be beaten and he kind of stole the race from the front. Yeah, he had been beaten in the um, Racing Post Trophy uh, by Magna Grisha the year before, and obviously Magna Grisha had come out and won the Guineas, so his form was strong. Um, he had a bit of he had a little bit of ground to make up in Magna Grisha, but he was a fresh horse at um, at the Curra, and that counted. Obviously, he didn't have a hard race in, in the English Guineas, so yeah, it was good good day. Um, two. Two Irish classics for Charlie. Um, he's been a lucky trainer for me. Fran, it's a sign of a good jockey, isn't it? Being able to change your mind halfway through a race. Like Jamie's just said, he intended on sitting behind the leaders and then thought, I'll, I'll, I'll take the bull by the horns and control the race. <coughs> the indeed, indeed, Martin. I suppose uh, that's, that's uh, a, you're right for trainers that have the confidence in you to let you do what you want and then it's you know having the nerve to do it like the easiest thing for Jamie on that occasion I'm sure would have been to take back get a lead ride and save but uh, he went to his own way and it duly paid off 2014 you made a decision and announced you were going to retire and uh, take a back seat and maybe uh, work in Shake for Hyde's racing organisation as a, as a manager and, um, and then you you, you did a bit of a U-turn and decided not to. Um, what can you tell us about that period? Um, <clears throat> I suppose I could have taken the easy option, but I've always kind of been happy to do my own thing. Um, um, I was even just saying to somebody the other day, I just don't think I'd, I'd ever be able to do a nine-to-five job. I'm just not even capable of it. Um, <laughs> uh, so... Um, you know, I like doing my own thing. I like sometimes I can wake up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning and, and I can look through pedigrees till till eight. And, um, you know, just, just because I like doing that sort of thing. Whereas, um, you know, I just felt that it was better that I continued riding and sort of be in control of my own sort of destiny and than being employed by somebody. Um, whether it's the right or wrong decision, I don't know. I'm happy doing, doing what I'm doing. I ride a lot for David Simcock. Um, <clears throat> I'm quite realistic of my of you know how 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 things are. You know, I, I ride sort of four or five days a week uh, in the busy period of summer, and have one or two days off 
you know, family stuff and that suits me. Well, we can't ride, none of us can ride forever. Um, you, you two are both just turned 40. I'm a little bit older, a year or two. Um, so yeah. when you do retire, is that, is that where you'll go to, <coughs> you go into the bloodstock side of things? Um, it's hard to say. Um, I suppose I do like the breeding side of it all. Um, it's always been kind of a little bit of a fascination. Um, uh, I breed some foals already. Well, it's been fortunate how it's worked out. Yeah, it's interesting. A, a good broomer is great to have a bad one to kill you. So um, we try and steer away from the bad ones. And, and and Jamie, we can't let you go, of course, without talking about your Cheltenham Festival winner, uh, Pizarro. You won the bumper name, of course, uh, beating the Irish banker Rhinestone Cowboy, I think it was. Um, obviously, Edward had greatly trained his horse, but what can you remember about that race? I know, I know, Norman Williamson still remembers it. Yeah, yeah, Norm, Norman. Um, <clears throat> I suppose I in in those winters when I'd finished the flat season, I used to go home to my mum's house in Tipperary and which our place bordered Edward O'Grady's so um, I used to ride out there um, Philip Fenton who I was very friendly with and all you know they're obviously the lads in the yard that you've grown up with so I used to go there in the winters and ride out maybe three or four days a week <clears throat> something to do and that winter Edward had two or three reasonably good bumper horses and this fellow won at um he won at nace and i thought i thought not about nothing of it and then the, the, i remember i was out i was sweating or i was sweating or something because i was going to dubai to ride in some race and i was miles away from where my mom's house was and uh my phone rang and it was edward saying that oh would i like to ride in the bumper so obviously i said yeah and the race went great <coughs> um he was a strong steer. He'd won like nearly a two and a half mile bumper at, at Nace, so I wanted to commit early. Um, and it you know, worked out well. They race inside the final furlong. Pizarro is hanging right into the Ironstone Cowboy. Back in front on the far side. Spencer having trouble keeping Pizarro straight. Here's Rhinestone Cowboy. He's got the rail to help him. Pizarro comes very close to him again. Pizarro, despite wavering, is just going to hold on from Rhinestone Cowboy. Obviously, um, there was a steward's inquiry afterwards, um, and I can remember this, the steward, Captain Hibbert Foy, and he, I can remember one day um, giving him a piece of my mind at Ascot about a year and a half earlier, and, and I got banned every chance he got, he banned me after that, so I knew not to say anything in the steward's room, and luckily they didn't change the result around. Um, but there's a lot, a lot of reasons why I enjoyed the, you know, winning, because obviously I'd grown up around O'Grady's, um, I've ridden <clears throat> it's my you know my home area so it's kind of more there's a lot of people that I was pleased for not just myself and obviously the opportunity from from Edward at the time um so yeah I even now I still cheer his horses on um, and I don't follow the jumps as as, as much but it'd be nice to see him have a good one again you talk, you've talked about some real characters there, especially Captain Hibbert Foy. I remember him, he used to ban me a lot as well. But <laughs> don't you think we've lost a lot of characters from the weighing room? I suppose there's new ones coming in. But um, I don't know about you, Jamie, but I, I mean, I miss Pat Edry, God rest his soul. We used to have a lot of fun with Grandad, didn't we? Yeah, Pat was brilliant. Um, you know, he was just, uh, as, it's, as you say, it's different. You know, Pat was um, ultimate professional in the room. You know, he's, he was like a big kid, really. But, you know, when he got out on the track, he murdered you. Know, whether it was an auto 60 or a, a group one, he, he'd kill you for a gap. But, um, you know, I suppose he, when you look back now, probably cheeky kids who behave, they just cut his socks up. And he's yeah. he always loved to rush to get home, cut his underpants sock or whatever. He just... He just put them on, even ripped up, and he'd just look over and swear at you and run off. And, uh, never you remember, I think Joe Fanning's the only one as quick as him to get changed. Uh, I think he'll give him a run for it. Do you remember we were in your house one night? We thought we were being burgled. It was him breaking in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pat was a good, good character. Um, but a kind man, Pat, too. Though. You know, I remember... Um, I'm often coming and, and saying, you know, this track, you need to do this, or you know, that you, you want to do, it, do that there. He, he wasn't just a selfish, all-for-himself person. And 
you know, Pat, he's, he's sorely missed. Um, I had huge ad- admiration for him uh, in and out of the saddle. Which of those jockeys of that era had a big influence <coughs> on you, Jamie? I know Fran told me earlier, Christy Roach was I suppose a- Mike, Michael can Michael can out. Well, yeah, Christy Roach was obviously, Christy Roach was obviously very good, very good to us all as apprentices. Um, well, he walked me in to get a few digs off Kevin Manning once. <laughs> 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 we'll leave that story after this. <laughs> um, but Christy Roach was a good influence to us. He used to always, you know, give you a lift to the races and advise you and whatever. But when it came to the big stage, Mick Canan, um, I remember, maybe you won't remember, going to France to ride the pacemaker for um, Monju one day and had spent the whole day with him. Well, basically, it was like a sponge. You know, you just everything he said made sense. And I was after getting beaten when I know meets at Leperstown the previous week. And, and he, he went through the race exactly what I'd done wrong and why I'd got, gotten beaten. So even though Mick never said a lot, he obviously he took everything in. And every now and again, he, he'd, he'd say a few things that um, made sense and was helpful. Um, you know, he admired him because he was winning all the big races around the world from, from the get-go from when we were all starting out. Yeah, he's a legend, Mick. I was talking to Mick last week. He's made a bucket list and on it is the Palio <coughs> he wants to, which I know you went with Andrea, didn't you, last year? Yeah. I mean, he needs, he needs to pace himself when he gets there. Those Italians like their wine. <laughs> <laughs> Won't be going too soon there. And cheese. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything left that you want to achieve in your career? Um, there's obviously always, look, Martin, you've won the Derby. We all dream to win the Derby. Most people win, you know, dream to win the, the Grand National or the Derby on the flat. Um, yeah, it's, I, I, was, I was placed a couple of times when I was younger, but I haven't really had much of a shout for the last eight or ten years at it. But, yeah, that's something that, it's, it's out of your grasp. But it's, it's something that if someone said to you, oh, could you, could you win this or, or that, you know, Obviously, I've, I've just got beaten. The Breeders' Cup Classic, Shorthead. Um, those races are the ones you kind of you look back on. You say, oh, "Wouldn't it be nice to win one of these?" But you got to be thankful for what you've got. Um, um, I've been very lucky, and <clears throat> I know some days can be a drag, and you, we all know it's a drag when you go racing, and whether you have lighter or it's been a long week or whatever. Um, but essentially, we've been paid to paid to our hobby for the last. In my case, 25 years, yours probably 35. And, and, and J- Jamie, just on that, on that hobby, obviously 2020 was a crap year in a lot of ways, but you had your first serious injury at, at, at the stage of your career. You broke your leg badly in a new market in, on a Gallops fall. <coughs> yeah, um, I can't say 2020 was a brilliant year. Um, I broke my hip and femur, um, like the femur, so... Yeah, it was a nasty injury. Um, it's like everything when you're a bit kind of dumb and you don't understand the injury, you, you're getting you're getting through it. But looking back, it was um, yeah, it was very demanding, and um, the re- the rehab was 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 hard. Um, uh, I wouldn't want a touch wood. I wouldn't want to go through it again. And then to top it off, I got COVID at Christmas, so <laughs> can't just actually say it was the the best year I've had, but we're into 2021, so hopefully every, everyone stays healthy and safe this year. And um, Obviously, our, our, we lost our good friend Pat Swallon this year, so it's another, another tough pill to take. It makes you look at your own life, doesn't it, when you, you see what Pat went through and, and how other people are suffering. Like you say, be thankful for what you've got. Um, but I want to ask you, Jamie, you've got Three young children, which I know you uh, enjoy spending a lot of time with. Chloe and Ella, they're, they're doing a lot of show jumping and riding. <coughs> I'm not sure Charlie's really into horses, but if either of your kids decided to go into racing in a serious way and become a jockey, what would you, what would you say? <coughs> um, well, obviously, if they want to do it, you'd support them. But, you know, it is a difficult industry. Um, Thankfully, Charlie looks like he's too big to be a jockey. So, um, yes, yeah, so, yeah. Look, if if it if it's if it's your passion, you know, you have to support it. Obviously, in an ideal world, I'd like them to do something a little bit less dangerous. And um, 
um, I suppose a, a job with more freedom. You know, we, what most people don't understand is our work is our work is at the weekend where most people finish work at five o'clock on Friday and they don't go back to nine on Monday. Whereas, you know, our busy time is the weekend, so it makes it makes it a bit more difficult um, to follow their hobbies as much as you'd like to do so. But we're not complaining. As I said, it's riding horses. It's a sport. Yeah, it's a dangerous sport. We, you know, sometimes we forget that we actually are followed by an ambulance and there's a medical crew there all the time. You know, for if it happens, but um, yeah, it's 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 a good sport, and I think if you don't take it too seriously, it's probably even better for people. Well, you're feeling better off that injury now, and you're. you're back in full working order. What's the plan for you now uh, into the new year? You've, you've riding abroad? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'll, I'll do a bit of Dubai from the end of this month, start that. Um, yeah, I'll get going now. I think uh, David has three or four horses going there. Um, so yeah, it's kind of another year. Um, I went to the Saudi Cup last year, second in the staying race. So I don't know if I can pick anything up for there, but you never know. Um, so yeah, it just kind of starts again. Obviously, we missed a lot of. Normally, I'd I'd have spent a good bit of time in November time in Australia, but it didn't happen this year because of COVID. So hopefully, um, this year we can find some form of normality and put the vaccine in handed out now. So yeah, it's, fingers crossed. Well, well, I suppose we better let you go, Jamie. Um, thanks for joining us, Fran. Have you got anything left to ask? No, no, it's a, it's it's good to have a chat with Jamie again. Time flies when you're having fun. It's it doesn't seem that long ago that I was leading him up as a 15 year old kid, and uh, from my dad, and uh, now it's still going as good as ever. It's great. You make it sound like he's older than you. You're the same age, aren't you? He's a little bit older, Martin, and uh, as you can see from his hairline, he's definitely we- not wearing as well. <laughs> <laughs> now, Fran, that's the one thing we agreed we wouldn't talk about: his hairline <laughs> <laughs> or hair dye. <laughs> he's not, he's not, he's the only man I know the only man I know to retire to come back with longer teeth and darker hair <laughs> yeah that's a good point <laughs> oh, well, listen Jamie right. thanks, thanks for, guys thanks for coming on we wish you all the best keep keep up the good work keep riding we, um, if you go I'll have no one else left to, left to talk to in the way yeah, I'll tell your silly dad jokes what do you mean by that <laughs> bye bye <laughs> cheers mate